Thank you for joining Stanford Social Innovation Review's webinar, Collective Impact. This is the latest in our series of webinars called SSIR Live. I'm Eric Nee, Managing Editor of Stanford Social Innovation Review and moderator of today's webinar. Stanford Social Innovation Review is published at the Center for Philanthropy and Civil Society at Stanford University. We launched SSIR Live to provide a forum for people involved in social innovation to discuss important topics. We host new webinars about once a month, choosing topics from among Stanford Social Innovation Review's most popular and important articles. So keep your eyes open for our upcoming events. Thank you very much for joining us today. Before getting started, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. If you are having any trouble with sound, click on the refresh button on the left-hand side of your screen. For any technical difficulties, you can click on the help button in the top right-hand corner. The webinar will last one hour. The first 35 minutes will be presentations by our featured speakers, followed by 25 minutes for questions and answers. Please submit your question by keying it into the box on the bottom left corner of your screen. Your question is anonymous. Please let me know if you are directing your question to one speaker in particular or to all of the speakers. The webinar will be accessible three hours from now by clicking on the same link you use today. You can freely access the webinar as many times as you'd like over the next year. Next slide. Today, Mark Kramer, Founder and Managing Director of FSG, John Kenya, Managing Director of FSG, will talk about their new theory of social change called Collective Impact. FSG is a global nonprofit consulting firm specializing in strategy, evaluation, and research to help organizations achieve greater social impact by discovering better ways to solve social problems. FSG and Stanford Social Innovation Review are longtime partners. We have produced several conferences together, and Mark and John have been frequent and popular authors in our journal. Their articles are always thought-provoking and generate a great deal of discussion among those concerned with social innovation. Their most recent article, titled Appropriate Enough Collective Impact, is no exception. According to Mark and John, solving large-scale social problems, such as poor quality K-12 education or poverty, requires coordinated action by a broad group of organizations from across all sectors, business, government, and nonprofits. Collaboration, of course, is nothing new. But according to Mark and John, collective impact initiatives have several unique characteristics that make them more effective. They will discuss these characteristics and other aspects of collective impact during our conversation. Mark and John are joined by two other leaders of social innovation, Jeff Edmondson and Patty Stonecipher. Jeff is the executive director of Strive Partnership, a group that has brought together leaders from across sectors, work together to improve education in the Cincinnati region. He's going to talk about why Strive has been so successful and what lessons we can all learn from his experience. Patty Stonecipher is chair of the White House Council on Community Solutions and the former CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. She's going to talk about the council and how its work will dovetail with the collective impact model. Thank you, Mark, John, Jeff, and Patty for presenting and discussing collective impact today. Let me now turn it over to Mark. Great. Thank you, Eric. And let's go to the next slide. You know, we've been working uh, with clients all over the world at FSG for the last decade, and I'm always amazed at the generosity of donors and the dedication of nonprofit leaders to really trying to make social change. And yet I have to admit I'm often discouraged by the inability to really achieve large-scale impact. And John and I hit on this theory of collective impact with the realization that part of the problem is this fundamental mismatch between the complexity of social problems and the way most philanthropists go about trying to solve them. As a funder, the, your role is naturally to pick a few grantees to fund out of the many applicants. And so the question you confront is, which of the many grantees is the one with the best approach or the most effective solution? And that means, of course, if you're on the grantee side, that you're really competing with other organizations in your same field 
to try and, and show that what you're doing is different from everybody else and more effective than everybody else, else, so you'll be the one to get the funding. It means that grantees end up working separately from each other. It means that when we think about evaluating a grant, we think about how to isolate the particular initiative we funded, holding everything else constant, and try and understand whether that particular initiative made a difference on the social problem. When we think about large-scale change, we think about how do we scale up these effective organizations or how do we replicate these effective programs. And throughout it, we really work with just the nonprofit sector without really trying to engage government or private corporations. And we've come to call this a model of isolated impact where we're looking for the one organization that can solve social problems. But, of course, social problems don't really work that way. The problems that Eric recited, whether it's education reform, poverty, or the environment, are the result of the interaction of many different organizations. And making progress really depends on aligning those organizations toward a common goal and giving them common measures so that they can look at the same body of data as they are making decisions. And, of course, the government and the corporate sectors are essential partners in collective impact. Now, there are elements of collective impact that sound like collaborations, a funder collaborative, a public-private partnership, a network, and it does indeed have elements of all of these other concepts. But we believe that collective impact is really a different paradigm because of five key dimensions that really distinguish collective impact from other forms of collaboration or partnership. If we can go to the next slide. These five conditions for success are, first, a common agenda. You know, we, we talk as if all of the organizations are working on the same problems, how to improve education, how to fight poverty. But, in fact, each organization has its own definition of the problem, its own approach, its own uh, uh, way of, of measuring its, its results. And it only appears as though we're working toward the same end. In a collective impact initiative, all of the participants have to come together around a shared vision for change and a common understanding of the problem. Jeff Edmondson will show a slide in a minute or two about the critical benchmarks and transition years in education. And that really is the definition of the common understanding of the education problem that all of the STRIVE organizations are embracing and working on. Second, we talk about shared measurement collecting data and measuring results in the same way across all of the participating organizations. Now, that sounds like a pipe dream, but FSG actually did a study last year. It's called Breakthroughs in Shared Measurement and Social Impact, and you can find it on our website at fsg.org. And we found about two dozen examples where anywhere from a few dozen to as many as 8,000 organizations in a field are using the same measures of performance in ways that enable them to compare their performance to each other and learn from each other. This is a key distinguishing feature of collective impact initiatives. It is really what helps organizations align their efforts, learn from each other, and it also keeps the community focused on a report card that focuses on the problem, that frames the problem, and that keeps people motivated to stay with their attempts to solve it. Third is mutually reinforcing activities. All of the participants in a collective impact initiative are doing different things. Each is doing the particular activity that is their greatest strength, that is their angle on the problem. But what's different from the way the nonprofit sector normally operates is that all of these activities fit into a single plan. They are aligned and coordinated. And that, of course, is what is missing throughout the nonprofit sector today. Fourth, continuous communication. It is very difficult to bring these organizations together, to keep them together, to build the level of trust that is necessary for organizations to work together effectively, particularly given the background of competitiveness that many nonprofit organizations come from, as well as the tensions between the different sectors of for-profit and nonprofit and government. 
We found each of these collective impact initiatives has regular in-person meetings. They can be monthly, they can be weekly, and continuous communication even between the meetings to build the level of trust and collaboration among the players. And lastly, and perhaps most important, collective impact initiatives have an infrastructure. They have a backbone organization with a specific set of skills and a structured process that holds the entire initiative together and coordinates the participating organizations. We think that the, it is very rare to find these five combinations working together. But when they do, we have seen examples in a number of fields that suggest that large-scale social change really can be achieved. And probably the best example we have seen is the example of Strive in Cincinnati, Ohio, and Northern Kentucky. And I'll turn it over to Jeff Edmondson to uh, talk a little bit more detail about what Strive is and how it has worked so far. Thanks so much, Mark. It's great to have this opportunity to, to talk about what we've learned uh, in, in creating the Strive Partnership. Um, the Strive Partnership was uh, formed in 2006 when uh, a cadre of community leaders from the sectors identified on the, on the slide came together really around uh, three major issues. First was a frustration uh, uh, in the community that in educational outcomes had not been improving uh, over time and had really remained stagnant. Um, uh, and particularly the funders in the community were wondering at what point their investments would lead to greater impact. Second was a recognition uh, that, that to stay competitive in a global economy, we had to get more students in and through some form of college. And then last was a rather dramatic um, uh, uh, assessment by the, the local coroner of all people who said that he felt like he would still continue to see students uh, in his office uh, as long as we didn't uh, take a more systemic approach to improving outcomes in education. So right now the STRIVE partnership includes over 300 people from these various sectors who have come together um, and are focused on a common uh, agenda for change. So this common table has been set um, to focus on three core cities, uh, Cincinnati, Newport and Covington, the last two of which are, happen to be located in northern Kentucky. It's a total of about 50,000 K-12 students, and including early childhood and higher ed, higher ed about 50,000 more, meaning the work of the partnership impacts around 100,000 students. Essentially, this table came together and uh, consistent with the condition outlined by Mark, uh, KnowledgeWorks, a foundation based in Cincinnati, Ohio, essentially acted as the backbone and support organization and said as long as these groups came together around the common problem of approaching, taking a more systemic approach to improving outcomes than we had in the past, they would make sure that the operational issues were taken care of. Next slide. So once the common table had been set, the first step was to set a common vision. And the student's journey to success outlined in the, in the roadmap which is on the following slide, uh, outlines that education really isn't about the Little Red Schoolhouse anymore. Instead, it is about a vision that starts at birth, goes through some form of college, and on the top includes academic benchmarks that kids need to hit along the way, but also social-emotional benchmarks. This was critical because it did redefine education from primarily being something that was pointed at as a K-12 issue to recognizing that education is a continuum starting at birth, going through some form of college, and has to include all those resources that impact both academic and social-emotional outcomes. So this became the common agenda for the community and was embodied in five core goals that were set. First, that every child be prepared for school on the front end of the roadmap, that every child would be supported inside and outside school on the bottom half, that they would succeed academically, that they would enroll in some form of college, and that they would graduate and enter a career. These goals are consistent in part with the transition points that Mark referenced along the roadmap, that the data says if a student is not on target at these critical junctures, they will, ha they will struggle to 
succeed on down the road. Next slide. The next step was to then set some measures that aligned with the five big, hairy, audacious goals, as you might call them, along the roadmap. This was a long process that, that we can't do justice to right now on the phone, but over the course of several months, 100-plus uh, indicators that people believed we had to track as a community to assess progress along the roadmap were boiled down into t to 10 core indicators that we have now tracked consistently over the course of three years. These indicators are outlined in the slide, but what's most important is that we have been very consistent in assessing these outcomes all along the way in order to give the community a sense of where we are in time. Next slide. In order to move these indicators, the question became, what is it that we should do collectively as a partnership? As is often the case in education or other social service arenas, sometimes the focus is on starting new programs. But to be quite honest, the funders said, in this community, we don't feel like we need more new programs, once again, because we are program rich and system poor. So the challenge put forward by the partnership was, how could we identify those strategies that would move the measures on this report card most dramatically, and then develop action plans that actually leverage the local resources? This essentially became the mutually reinforcing activities that Mark outlined in the conditions. So around each of the boxes you see along the roadmap, as well as a few others, we developed networks or collaboratives of organizations that do this work already and worked with them to go through what we took from the business sector, the Six Sigma, Six Sigma Continuous Improvement Process, and draft, re, reworded that so it applied to the social sector. And in each of these areas, we, we provided facilitators and data experts to walk through, for example, all the tutoring programs that are working towards improving fourth grade reading, to walk all of them through a process of developing a common action plan that identified what really worked in tutoring programs for kids and what should we build on in order to be most successful. It is really important to note along the bottom of the slide that without having the capacity to collect, manage, and analyze data, it will be very difficult to realize collective impact. If we move on to the next slide, we have realized significant progress to date. We've set the table. We have a common language through Six Sigma to promote continuous improvement. We are seeing improvement on the ground. We've moved from 30 outcome indicators in, in the baseline year of 2008 trending in the right direction to 40 of 53 total outcomes trending in the right direction. We've also seen that funders have begun to coordinate their efforts and were recently awarded a Social Innovation Fund grant uh, that has helped us to really align leaders around those strategies and those action plans that are having the most impact. But perhaps most importantly to, sh to, to talk through are the lessons that we've learned to date. Some of those are captured on here and to go through them really quickly, the first is that if you're creating one of these partnerships, making the report card a priority, establishing the data as the foundation for why the partnership is coming together could not be more critical. And not only putting out a baseline report card, but actually setting targets so that the partnership as a whole has a purpose and a direction to how they can work together and add value. The core idea here is to promote shared accountability within the partnership while recognizing that there is going to be some differentiated responsibility for moving specific outcomes. When it comes to a manageable scope of work, when we started, we had somewhere around 15 to 20 of the collaboratives that I discussed. While that was a good thing to do since we were pioneering the field here, in the end, having three to five core strategies to start from that don't just focus on one portion of the roadmap, but focus on across the roadmap is absolutely critical to demonstrate that you are working consistently with your vision. Related to communications and community engagement, this is not a silver bullet, and people will continue to expect a silver bullet when you bring the right leaders to the table. 
it is, it is absolutely critical to build an understanding that this is going to be a long-term approach to build what we're terming the civic infrastructure to support student success. Fourth, the engagement of policymakers can be particularly challenging at times, especially given the fact that we're t we were talking about two different states with three different cities. But it's absolutely critical as in the field of education, as in many of other sectors, public dollars drive much of the initiatives uh, that will need to be influenced by the work. And then last, the idea of pooling resources in a local community is critical as well. We have many stumbling blocks and stories to tell at this, on this front, but engaging funders from the outset in this initiative will be critical as the movement of their dollars will help to dictate people's understandings, understanding of how the partnership is operating to change a system. So very quickly to conclude, we're actually, uh, if we go to the next slide, working in multiple cities around the country to draw lessons learned from the work in Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky. Uh, working in partnership with Living Cities and the Coalition of Urban Serving Universities. We've identified and been working with four other cities around the country, identified on the map with the large stars. And we also provided smaller grants to f five other communities to begin to test whether or not we could develop similar partners in other communities and what we could draw from what we've learned in Cincinnati uh, and Northern Kentucky. If you go to the next slide, you'll see a framework that we have developed for building what we are once again terming the civic infrastructure. Essentially, there are four pillars, partnership development, evidence-based decision-making, collaboration and capacity building, and investment and sustainability. And around each of those, we have drawn lessons learned that ha can help a community to move much more swiftly to developing the civic infrastructure. Essentially, the conditions that mark and John will speak to, have captured the essence of why this work is important. And while it can be very difficult navigating the politics and the other issues that are at play when you begin to try to change systems, those conditions outline the essence of why this framework can be so critical for supporting improved student outcomes in a given community. So with that, John, I'll pass it on to you. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Next slide, please. So Mark has laid the groundwork for key principles and components of collective impact, and Jeff has shared in detail how STRIVE and a partnership of over 300 organizations in Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky are achieving compelling results through a collective impact approach. What I'd like to do is highlight three key findings we surfaced during our research on collective impact efforts. First, as exciting as STRIVE's results are for education reform, it's important to note that this approach to solving complex social problems isn't limited to STRIVE, and it actually isn't limited to the education sector for that matter. In our experience, collective impact efforts embodying all five elements for success that Mark talked about continue to be rare, and in the article we touch on other types of collaborations such as social sector networks and public-private partnerships that have had mixed records of success. Nonetheless, our research surfaced successful collective impact initiatives happening in a variety of sectors, including the environment, healthcare, human services, and even in the arena of global development. Second, it's important to note that there's no one recipe concerning what type of organization should play the catalyst and backbone roles in initiating and coordinating collective impact efforts. The Elizabeth River effort profile in the article is focused on wetlands restoration in southeast Virginia. In this case, the organization that was an initial catalyst to river restoration efforts and now serves as the existing backbone organization is the Elizabeth River Project. This is a nonprofit founded by wetlands river activist Marjorie Mayfield Jackson. The Elizabeth River Project was successful in engaging more than 100 stakeholders, including four local city governments, the EPA, the U.S. Navy, dozens of local businesses, schools, community groups, and universities in developing an 18-point plan to restore the Elizabeth River watershed. The result of the Elizabeth River Project's efforts has been that over a 15-year period, water quality in the watershed has significantly improved and the presence of pollutants has diminished considerably. In the healthcare arena, Shape Up Somerville is a citywide effort in Somerville, Massachusetts designed to prevent childhood obesity. 
This initiative was in turn coordinated by researchers from Tufts University who served in effect as the backbone organization in this case. The effort was catalyzed by a set of national funders, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Robert Wood Johnson, Blue Cross of Massachusetts, and also several local funders, including the United Way. The result of this cross-sector collaboration was a significant decrease in young children's body mass in just three years' time. We've even seen companies play the catalyst role in collective impact efforts. Mars, the candy company, is working to improve the lives of more than 500,000 impoverished cocoa farmers in Cote d'Ivoire, where Mars sources much of its cocoa. Mars recognized that improving the lives of these impoverished farm farmers was A, critical to the health of their supply chain, and B, something they couldn't do alone. So they have embarked on an initiative that engages local government, NGOs, the World Bank, bilateral donors, and even direct competitors in a common agenda focused on transforming the cocoa sector. In mobilizing these various parties, Mars utilized outside advisors to lay the groundwork for a collective agenda and has subsequently attracted an agricultural development NGO with significant experience in Africa to serve as the backbone organization for the effort. Now, a last point that surfaced from our research is the importance of the mindset shift that's required of social sector participants for collective impact efforts to truly make headway against complex social issues. And on this issue, I'd like to hold for a moment. So next slide, please. Nonprofits and funders alike generally overlook the potential for collective impact because they are accustomed to focusing on independent action as the vehicle for social change. For nonprofits, a critical shift required is moving from their own organization's agenda to coordinating agendas with other partner organizations in ways that reinforce activities between organizations instead of creating competition. For example, in the Elizabeth River Project, there are dozens of nonprofits involved, but each, in agreeing to the 18-point watershed restoration plan, is playing a different role based on its particular capabilities. One group of organization works, organizations work on creating grassroots support and engagement among citizens. A second group works with industry to achieve voluntary reduction in pollution by businesses. And a third set of organizations coordinates and reviews research. This requires a new approach to communication and transparency among peer nonprofits. It also importantly requires nonprofit leaders to educate their boards. Boards must be motivated to shift their lens from oversight of just their own organization to a wider view of how the collective can make progress against an issue. Now, of course, a critical motivator for boards and, and many senior nonprofit leaders is what their funders are focused on. In the successful collective impact efforts we researched, there was a fundamental change in how funders saw their role. And this we can't emphasize enough. To achieve large-scale change, funders need to move from funding individual organizations and grantees to leading a long-term process of social change that engages all sectors in developing solutions. This means a couple of things. First, funders, and in particular foundations, need to understand that not only government, but also corporations must be engaged in order to foster innovation and accelerate complex social change efforts. In the case of STRIVE, as Jeff had pointed out earlier, the educational collaborative partners were able to take pages from GE Company's quality-driven Six Sigma process to develop successful education-based, uh, uh, evidence-based education practices. In the case of both Elizabeth River and Shape Up Somerville, changing the behavior of businesses and engaging the skills of businesses' employees in developing solutions has been critical to making progress. And in the case of the cocoa sector transformation in Cote d'Ivoire, Mars' company's technical expertise in cocoa growing practices and implanting new disease-resistant, higher productivity cocoa trees is central, central to helping impoverished cocoa, cocoa farmers achieve a level of prosperity. Now, focusing on collective impact will also require funders to make investments and use grants in very untraditional ways. Instead of just funding individual programs or even building the capacity of individual organizations, funders must pay attention to the relationships between organizations, building the capacity of the whole system to act together. In the examples we've talked about today, funders made investments in backbone organizations, they funded the development of shared measurement systems, and they supported grantees 
and developing shared strategies and shared theories of change. These investments are clearly outside the typical direct service and advocacy grants that make up the vast majority of today's grant making. However, it's important to know that these collective infrastructure investments are highly, highly leveraged. Sky, for example, has a $1.5 million budget in Cincinnati, but is coordinating efforts and increasing the effectiveness of organizations with combined budgets of $7 billion. The net net for collective impact efforts to take hold more broadly, it's critical that funders be willing to embrace this new approach and invest sufficient resources in the necessary facilitation, coordination, and measurement that enables organizations to work in concert and establishes the required infrastructure to achieve large-scale change. Now, we're fortunate to have with us today Patty Stonecipher, who has done a lot of thinking about what it takes to create large-scale social change, both in her past role as CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and also in her current role. Patty, I'll hand it over to you for your thoughts. Thank you, John. I'm participating in this webinar for the same reason that it looks like over 500 others are. I'll use Sarge Shriver's words today. It's well to be prepared for life as it is, but it's better to be prepared to make life better than it is. And I think already this uh, call has helped me um, consider ways we can make life better than it is. President Obama has spoken about this being an all-hands-on-deck moment for our nation with all of the challenges that we face. And the White House Council for Community Solutions was created to help accelerate and drive the critical goal of all citizens, all sectors working together. You can see on the slide what the President asked us to do, and we are in the process now, just a few weeks after the executive order was signed, of sharpening that focus focus and organizing ourselves for the greatest impact. In the process of sharpening focus, one of the, our council colleagues, Paul Schmidt from Public Allies, reminded all of us that we can find hundreds of examples of good projects and good leaders. We've all seen them, we know them, but why can't we find more projects that cause real, in Paul, Paul's words, needle jumping, where big issues across big populations solve big change in a lasting way? And if we can find a few of those, can't we understand what caused that needle to jump? So we started looking and found right away that Mark and John have been asking the same question and that the Strive Project and the Elizabeth River Project and others may show us a new way. So we have asked Mark and John uh, to help the council listen, learn, and understand uh, what the knowledge they have uh, collected is and whether there is a new approach um, that the council ought to consider as part of the effort that we spotlight. In the process of learning about all this, one of my colleagues from Gates, Louis Borstein, pointed out to me that it's equally important to consider this uh, in efforts around the world. His team works to improve sanitation in the developing world, affecting over 4 billion people, and he's observed that without the collective impact approach, uh, achieving real changes to rural sanitation will be doubly challenging because lasting change won't occur unless a wide range of stakeholders play not only to their own strengths but to coordinating the effort. Mark also asked when I uh, agreed to join this call to say a few words about philanthropy and as some of you know I stepped down as CEO from Gates a few years ago but I still work with not just Gates but other big donors and I think the funders attributes that John identified for collective impact success are challenging for entrepreneurial donors, but it's an addressable challenge. Many of our nation's biggest and newest donors made the money they're giving away by creating technical solutions to emerging problems and creating new market opportunities. So the whole area of adaptive uh, problems and collective impact is one that is harder sometimes to relate to. But what I've seen in the success stories, including the one that Jeff described from Strive is that, yes, these are adaptive problems, but by applying a rigorous approach, having solid goals, clear measures, lots of communications, and being evidence-driven, I think we can attract the attention and uh, resources of a whole generation of donors who have been working 
on funding leading organizations but not seeing the needle moving they hoped for and are ready to invest in new ways to, in the hopes of seeing the community-wide solutions that we're all on this call because we share the goal of hoping to see it. I'll turn it back to Eric now for questions. Thank you, Patty, and thank you, Jeff, John, and Mark, for your interesting presentations. Next slide, please. So for the next 25 minutes, it's the time for you to ask your questions of our presenters. If you have a question, please submit it by keying the question into the box on the bottom left corner of your screen. We obviously won't have time to field everyone's questions, but we will get to as many of them as we can. So a number of questions that were submitted um, by members of the audience concerned the backbone organization. Let me just throw out a couple of, um, of those and, and concerns about them. And um, maybe you, Mark, and, uh, and Jeff, uh, follow, could, could address them. Mark, a little bit on the more broad level, and Jeff, maybe based on your experience at Strive. Um, the, question, the questions are about how important is it that a separate entity leads this collaborative effort and that, it, that a new backbone organization be created. Some people were concerned that it may be just adding another layer of bureaucracy. Um, others were, had a question about does it need to be a new organization or could it be a foundation or an existing nonprofit? Um, can, can the function of a backbone organization be be somehow fulfilled in in another manner. Mark, why don't you start yeah, off, and then Jeff, it, maybe. Thanks, Eric. It's a, it's a great set of questions, and I would say we have seen a, a couple different models. Uh, you know, FSG, uh, we ourselves have been working in a couple communities uh, to try and uh, help launch collective impact initiatives uh, with a local organization, and we've often played the role of helping uh, sort of staff the initiative, develop it, bring the parties together, and help train the local organization to take it forward. But in general, we do believe that it is uh, important that the organization be neutral. And in most cases, that means a new player, not one of the existing nonprofits that's currently working on the issue. Uh, you know, as we mentioned, there are competitive forces bet between nonprofits, and nonprofits are of vastly different sizes. And the backbone organization needs to be able to create a level playing field where everyone feels that they're being heard and being treated fairly and that there isn't any favoritism. So I, I think it's, uh, in a sense, it is a layer of overhead. There's no question about it. But we think it is the key layer of overhead that enables all of the different organizations working on the issue to begin to work together and align their efforts. And that, we think, is immensely valuable. You know, we talk about collaboration all the time as if just bringing organizations together into a room is going to somehow lead to collaboration. But collaboration takes time and effort. The data collection that Jeff talked about, which is central to this, somebody has to do it. And none of the existing organizations have the extra staff capacity to make this happen. Jeff, what do you want to add from a more practical perspective, having lived this? I would just add that it's important to note that the Strive Partnership is not a new 501c3 in Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky, and that was done very intentionally. Um, early on in the development of the partnership, it, the question was raised, should we form a new organization? And it was assumed that that would go counter to the purpose of the partnership which was to drive alignment and efficiency in order to increase effectiveness. So to this day, we remain a subsidiary of the host organization, the backbone organization, KnowledgeWorks Foundation, but we report directly to the leadership body, we call it the executive committee, of the key leaders within the community driving this initiative from the education, business, nonprofit, philanthropic, and civic sectors. So it was actually critical in our case not to create something new, but to create a, a completely neutral third party that acted almost more to drive a movement within the community than to create a new organization. And as we've worked across the country, we have seen this play out to where people tend to resist having an existing entity 
and that they prefer the concept of having either repurposing a, a, an existing body to perform this role or to simply forming this partnership structure with a neutral third party asking as, a, acting as the fiscal intermediary. Eric, I, I just might add, it, it, the Knowledge Works to Strive model in which Strive was you know, really incubated uh, within the Knowledge Works Foundation, I think is is interesting to think about from the funder's perspective uh, as a way to catalyze uh, these efforts. And I, I know there are a number of uh, community foundations uh, tuning into the webinar. And we work with a lot of community foundations, community foundations around the country, and we do think that uh, community foundations are well positioned because of their generally perceived neutrality uh, and their staff capacity uh, to, at a minimum, uh, uh, really you know, incubate collective impact efforts. I think we've seen that in places like uh, Greater Southwood County in Wisconsin. Uh, we've seen it here in Boston with the Boston Foundation. Um, we've seen it in Park City. Uh, uh, with the Park City Community Foundation. So I, I think uh, community foundations are, you know, interesting um, potential role players in the collective impact effort, both in terms of thinking about incubating these uh, initiatives and potentially in some instances being engaged uh, in an ongoing way, playing that backbone role. If I was just to add one more comment to, there, to this, it would be that, one, United Ways also present a unique opportunity similar to community foundations, depending on their context. But the first one is if you're really trying to identify an existing entity, if they have historically been very rigorous and committed to using data or over time have involved in that capacity, it will add to their ability to do this because the heart of the work has to rest on the core vision and the core outcomes that the community is trying to move. So the commitment to using data will dramatically increase the organization's ability to lead. Um, there's, a, there's a number of follow-up questions, um, one of which involves leadership. Um, I guess, how important is it to have top leaders involved in the process? And what happens when there's changeovers in the leadership of the organizations that are part of um, this collaborative effort. So, because as, as we all know, often when a new, a new leader takes over an organization, they they want to make their mark, um, and, and um, a partnership like this um, could be uh, vulnerable, as as particularly with a when it involves so many organizations, where you naturally have changes over leaders of leadership. Over time, I'm wondering, have you had to deal with that, uh, Jeff? And if so, is that proving to be a problem? Well, first, I would I would uh, say that having the top leadership engaged is absolutely critical at the clear risk of being perceived as top down. Um, one of our key lessons is that is that we brought along the critical leadership very effectively, but in our work to define the purpose of this entity. We often did not engage or communicate effectively with the community as a whole. And so we've made some very conscientious and practical steps to, to begin to engage the community at large in the vision. Uh, we have had incredible turnover, actually, in leadership. Uh, it was uh, Nancy Zimfer, as president of the University of Cincinnati, who really was the driving force behind this work, who left to become the chancellor of the State University of New York and who has continued to champion this work. But her departure clearly had an impact. We've had two superintendents change, two presidents change, um, and, and several other community leaders come and go. But the table has remained, and the reason for that primarily is that, one, the, the vision is compelling, and people seem to understand that the programmatic approach is not going to work, and two, the peer pressure that anybody coming in would have uh, is, is, is significant, and it's a table where they want to be in order to drive change. And then uh, last, there is uh, essentially an, uh, an effort on our part over time to make the partnership part of individual organizations' strategic plans so that when somebody comes in, it's, it's part of the fabric of the individual organizations as well. Patty, let me ask you a question. I know you're no longer head of the Gates 
foundation, but um, you had a long experience uh, in the role of a funder. One of our um, people in our audience uh, asked, says, Um, I'm wondering, in your experience, how do how do we get funders to understand the collective impact approach and, and also practice it? Yes, I think that donors often um, lock into an, a strategy and approach, and I, I hold myself guilty of that because they are also eager for change, just like our individual not-for-profit boards and leaders lock in to their own approach. And the kind of evidence that we saw with STRIVE, the kind of communication that we're seeing from FSG, I think is necessary to not just get to program officers but to principals in donor organizations to show what kind of change can happen if instead of looking for individual leaders and in, 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 in organizations, but also when donors are willing to say, I'm willing to be to know that I'm contributing to this change, not that I can get personal attribution for each change. And I think this issue with donors having to give up some level of control and identification over individual attribution that this dollar resulted in this change is a big one. And I think some of the evidence base and uh, data that we're seeing here is going to be essential for people to be confident that collectively you'll get the answer. You just may not be able to tie it to your individual dollars, which we've trained so many philanthropists uh, to look for. Mark um, and John, a couple questions were um, at a bit higher level, which is how does one understand whether a problem is one that's suitable for um, the collective impact approach? Is there a way to assess both the problem itself to understand whether it's one that's suitable and, and also whether um, it's ready for this sort of approach. John, do you want to respond? Well, I think it, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, it, in the article and in, in some of our past, um, you know, uh, references, uh, uh, to to this approach, um, we we in San Francisco Innovation we we talk about the notion of you know adaptive problems versus technical problems, uh, borrowing from Ron Heifetz's uh, uh, framing, and you know there are certain uh, issues uh, and, and and needs you know in the nonprofit sector in the social sector uh, that are technical in nature that uh, you know the solution exists. Uh, you know, if a, if a food bank needs a new inventory system, uh, if a hospital needs a, a new maternity wing. And, you know, these are very clear problems that uh, can be solved and, and don't require collective impact. In fact, collective impact might get in the way uh, just in terms of getting to uh, a solution more quickly. I think in answers where or issues where there is going to be, you know, what, what's required is behavior change uh, by multiple stakeholders uh, who, uh, for whom this is a problem. They have a problem. And, you know, that's really any of the big, hairy, gnarly problems that we have in the social sector, uh, whether or not it's education reform or poverty reduction or climate change. Uh, you know, it, it, it's hard to imagine that uh, an isolated impact approach, as, as, as Mark referenced up front, would ever, ever work. Uh, and, and we believe these problems uh, that are adaptive in nature uh, need to be approached in a collective way. Jeff, did you want to add to that? Um, my only thought was that we struggled up front with engaging funders because the concept was so big, and we continued to try to present to them the entire agenda. And what we found was most useful, and it may be obvious to most of you, is to identify how individual funders, where their interests lie on the roadmap in our case, on that cradle-to-career agenda, and then very specifically discuss with them how they would like to increase impact. Uh, in, in their investments and determine what the right fit is and what would be the right way to communicate with them about those uh, programs or systems that are having the greatest impact on the outcomes they want to move. 
So sometimes it, it, it can be that the uh, the presentation of information in the global format and the broad vision may overwhelm funders who are traditionally focused on very targeted outcomes. Um, Patty, a question for you. Because um, the council is a new organization, and people are quite curious about what, what its plans are. I'm not sure if you've um, met or not, um, but one of the questions is whether the White House is, is targeting specific communities or issue areas um, at this point? Uh, we have not formally met yet. We've begun several learning calls and purport, uh, preparation work, um, but we are, we are planning to pick a focused area, and uh, we'll meet the first week of February to finalize that. Focus area would be something such as education or the environment? Correct. And what role do you see the White House playing? Um, I would guess, you know, for collective impact to work, it has to be in largely an organic process. You have to have people in the community that um, are committed to and concerned about solving this problem. What role then would, would the White House play in supporting that? Well, we've been mapping all of the dollars and funds and efforts going on across all of the federal agencies, but realistically, a council that exists for two years like this, even though it has fabulous leaders from the corporate sector, nonprofit, uh, academia, um, uh, people on the ground, um, we do think our, our three biggest areas of contribution will be um, spotlighting and communicating you know, between groups that are considering the best ways to do community solutions um, and using the bully pulpit of the White House and the leadership of the council to draw attention to the very best. Secondly, we think there may be some additional need to identify effective policy, uh, effective proposals for whether it's funders or governments, make some strong recommendations for ways we could go further faster with community solutions. And third, see if there really are some promising efforts that we could bring uh, corporate spotlight and resources and uh, funders and others just kind of see if there are some things already happening um, that could scale faster and impact further if we use the collective uh, bully pulpit and resources of the council. Mm -hmm. well, in regards to that, one of our questioners um, said one of the things that the government could do to help support initiatives like this is to commit to longer-term funding. Is that an issue that you think you can address and that's important to address? Well, it's, it's one of the kinds of policy recommendations that we will look at. Um, like I said, we're still in the organizing, and I think the answer to that really depends on what, exa what, what part of the problem are you looking at. But um, I just have to accept also responsibility for the fact that the answer could be true of many philanthropic funders, too. Uh, too short of range uh, funding for something that's trying to do this scale of change in a community or um, keeps the leaders out seeking new partners all of the time instead of having a reliance. Um, and there's a balance between holding people accountable but assuring future resources that both the government and private funders need to be looking at for projects like this one. The last question I'd like to, to throw out um, I think an appropriate one. Um, one of the things that we don't want to do is, is to um, engage in sort of groupthink. Um, and Mark and John, you guys have always been great about coming up with ideas that are out of the box. Isn't one of the risks of creating um, a, a collective impact approach where people are working this closely together, um, trying to, you know, compromise uh, to, to achieve um, these big goals, isn't it going to be harder for out-of-the-box thinking to take place for organizations that don't fit the model to get funding or to get support in a community? Um, well, I'll, I'll uh, address and maybe take a shot at that. I think one of the critical things to recognize, um, at least in the uh, approach that we're advocating for, is that um, the the collective impro, uh, impact approach in and of itself uh, is is not 
you know, and evidence-based solutions. Evidence-based solutions, as Jeff talked about with Strive, you know, are going to exist inside of the collective, inside of the collaborative. Uh, you know, evidence-based solutions around early childhood, evidence-based solutions around uh, college access. And, you know, I, I think uh, there, there's still, you know, there, there still is going to be a need for innovative outside-the-box solutions uh, uh, to, to, to push the ball forward. I think, you know, an interesting sort of just analog or, you know, example is, is charter schools and district reform. Uh, charter schools, on the one hand, are, you know, tremendous innovators and in new approaches to how teachers teach and, and how students learn and uh, have, uh, in my opinion, created a significant amount of value in, in sort of pushing things forward in education. On the other hand, if they always exist outside the system, uh, outside of a, a collective district-wide effort, uh, it's unlikely they're ever in and of themselves going to achieve large-scale change. And I think, you know, with a focus on the indicators and making progress on, you know, uh, uh, the, you know the, the specific indicators in and of themselves, it doesn't sort of preclude that you can't, uh, you know, try new innovative solutions. I would just, and I would just add to that, John, that, that you're not going to be able to get every funder in a given community to buy into this concept. And it would seem that in the social sector in general, entrepreneurial, the entrepreneurial spirit has not been our problem, and that there will always be people coming up with great ideas. There will always be funders out there who are willing to support them, and that that should continue. The benefit of the partnership is, one, to, to target those innovations towards very specific outcomes, mm. and, and number two, it is, to, uh, it is to help you make decisions about what innovations are really most relevant so that you may not spend as much time on those that won't really help you as a community improve outcomes. And, and I'll just add, I always remember I was on a panel a few years ago with Al Gore talking about the environment, and he said there is no silver bullet, but we have silver buckshot. And I really believe that in many cases we spend so much time trying to figure out what's the big idea out of the box that's going to be the answer to this social problem. And instead, there are lots of little improvements that enable the system that is so dysfunctional and disconnected now to work better. You know, tutors and after-school programs don't know what's going on in the classroom for the student they're tutoring. But Strive has found a way to get that information to them, to overcome the privacy concerns, get parents to give permission to share their students' reports. Preschools don't know what kindergarten entry-level kids need, and yet there's a way to do that. There are all these different parts of the system, and education is one example, but it's true in every major social problem, that is functioning independently, not aligned and not aware of what the other pieces are doing. And rather than look for the next big idea that is the answer, I think that funders can play a tremendously powerful role by helping the pieces within the system work together more effectively. Well, on that note, Mark, um, I think that's a good place to end our discussion. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, um, but I think everyone will agree this has been a, a, a great discussion, and I want to th thank Mark, John, Jeff, and Patty for participating. Next slide, please. Well, if this discussion has, has really sparked your interest and you'd like to come out to sunny California, where the, where the, where the weather is always warm, um, on March 23rd, we are going to have a conference on collective impact at Stanford University. It's going to be a day-long conference. And we would encourage you, if you're interested, to contact um, uh, Michelle, whose uh, contact information is on this slide get more information. Next slide, please. Uh, just to wrap up, uh, thank you again for joining us. Um, when you log off, um, a brief survey will come up, um, and we would like you to fill it out if you could. Um, this webinar will be available for the next 12 months, um, and information about how to get, get to it is, uh, is here on this slide. Basically, you just Check, uh, click on the same link as you did today. Um, if you haven't already read Mark and John's article in our winter 2011 issue, go to our website where a free copy of it is available. 
Um, our next conversation today was interesting. I think you will find that one interesting as well. Um, Jocelyn Wyatt, who's with IDO, probably the preeminent design firm in the world, is going to be talking about how they use their design thinking to tackle social problems. Thank you again for participating, and we look forward to having you uh, join us in our next webinar.